Hello and welcome. My name is Kenny Meesters, and on behalf of my co-authors Andreas Alexiou and Professor Carol Wu, I would like to welcome you to our presentation of the research paper entitled Towards a Model for Building Information Awareness in Crisis Situations. And to introduce our paper to you, I would like to talk with you about three subjects. The first one is the motivation and the rationale behind our research, which is about emergency response and crisis management. The second part we'd like to talk to you about is the theoretical foundations of our research, our research approach, our cases, data collection, uh, and the setup of our research. Finally, we'll take the results from those efforts from our research and discuss them with you in the findings. But first, let's talk about the motivation of our research and actually the, the, the main problem that we're looking at. So when we talk about crisis situations and disaster response, there's a lot of definitions. We won't go into too many details, but for our research, we really look at situation with the following characteristics. First of all, we're dealing with something that is unpredictable. That doesn't mean that we don't know that an earthquake could happen or a typhoon could strike or a global pandemic could occur, but it does mean that we don't always know exactly when, how, and where it will happen. But we also can't always predict what exactly the consequences, the consequences will be when such an event occurs. We know an earthquake could happen, but we don't always know exactly how the buildings will be affected, how many people will be affected, what aid is required. Because our society is constantly evolving, people are building houses, people become more resilient, uh, new technologies develop, and so on. So it's not always clear in an emergency what is needed, what is happening, and what should be done about it. The second part is that there is no time. When we're dealing with an emergency, we don't have the time to gather all the information, to do a rigorous evaluation of everything that we could know, get all the people together, do a in-depth rational decision-making process. In a crisis, you need to act now. Often lives are on the line, humanitarian aid is needed, and things need to mobilize quickly. So immediate action is required. And finally, there's no plan, which might be a bit controversial, but because surely plans do exist for emergency agencies and international emer disaster response, etc. Of course, we know individual capacities that are there, including firefighting, emergency services, and so on, but we don't always know what is needed or how do we get it there. Every situation may unfold differently. And while we have building blocks, we don't necessarily always know how to put them together in what way, because it always needs to be tailored to that specific emergency, to that specific country, context, or the humanitarian needs that arise. So all of this leads to that we have limited time, high uncertainty, and limited information about what is happening. Now, this is, uh, can be clearly explained in this following graph. In the early stages of a disaster, there is limited information and there's a high degree of uncertainty, which means that everything we do, every decision that we make is based on very limited information, comes with a high degree of uncertainty and is based on our previous experiences, uh, on uh, small signals, uh, etc. But as the time moves on, the information starts coming. We're getting reports, media is reporting. We can use social media to get information. So the information flow goes up and might not all the information may be there, but the uncertainty starts going down. At this stage, at least we know what information is missing and what actions we should take to get the information. And then as time moves on, the flow of information stabilizes and we get a constant stream of updates and the uncertainty goes down. And at this stage, we can make well-informed decisions. Of course, this is very simplified because it very much depends on the emergency, how such a uh, line will follow. You can imagine that for a sudden onset earthquake, this might be uh, a more, you get towards a stable situation. But as we saw with COVID-19, the situation kept evolving and actually the uncertainty continues as well. In any case, whatever situation we're in, we're dealing with a high, with a degree of uncertainty that we want to get down as quickly as possible by getting more information. And this is the role of information management. Simply put, 
With information management, what we're trying to do is to provide the right people with the right information at the right time in the right format, which sounds like an easy task, right? You find the information, you find, you get it to the person who needs it on time. But in an emergency, there is not just one actor. It's not a simple matter of, I have an information need, I have a question, I'll ask it to somebody and I'll get the information back in the form of an answer. In fact, in an emergency, there are many different actors. Uh, in a large, imagine large earthquake response, there are international responders, there are local communities, there's local authorities, private companies, etc. And all of these actors have a piece of the information. Nobody has the complete overview. Everybody has a piece of information that can address your information needs and help you to make decisions. At the same time, you yourself will likely have information that other people need as well. So you could address the information needs of others. So all in all, this quickly becomes a complicated network of different actors that all have bits and pieces of the information. And the goal is here to ensure that this ends up in the right place, making this puzzle. But th there's also the risk that somebody might not even be connected to, every, to anything. Somebody that has valuable information might not even be visible to the other people. So this is what we wanted to investigate in our research. Simply put, if we look at all the information that is available that we could use to make better decisions in emergencies to get this uncertainty down, how well does it connect to the, uh, to the information needs? And one of the ways that we're looking into this is what we propose as information awareness. A first step to getting the information to where it needs to be is being aware of who these other people are and what the information is that they have. So we wanted to examine how this information awareness concept would look like in theory and how that looks like in practice. So this is what we've done in our research. We've taken, uh, first of all, the step of looking at existing literature. And in this literature, we found uh, concepts from sense-making, building situational awareness. We looked at information management as well as coordination theory. And from those theories combined, we developed a conceptual model. That model describes different steps that an organization can take to start finding information. And the first step in this process is to find what information you need. It's sort of introspectively looking at your own organization, what information might help us to make better decisions. This is your own information needs. The second step is to start finding out these other actors, these other uh, people that have the information. And here you, we can make a distinction between you yourself searching for other people that may have the information, but also other people finding you. So there's an active approach where you're searching out. It could also be a passive approach where you make yourself known as well as your information needs and allow other people to find you. Um, so both approaches can be used. Once you've known the actor or you find the actor or the actor finds you, the next step is to assess what information they have. And here again, we can make a distinction. The first one is that we can look at what information they currently have. What information does an actor have that can address my information needs? But actors may not have all the information readily available, but they could get the information. For example, a community that is affected might not know at that moment which buildings are affected in their, in their district or how many, but it is information they could gather for you, uh, provided they have the time, the resources, and so on. So it's important to not only look at information that is readily available, but information that could be available from such an actor. And finally, when this awareness has been built, if you know the actor, if you know what information they could provide, you start the next step of establishing a relationship on how that information can come to your organization and vice or vice versa, which information your organization could share to other actors. So this is the model that we've developed from theory. So the next step in our research was to take this model and start examining how it would look like in uh, case studies. 
And for this, we've selected two case studies. One is an older case study based on the Nepal earthquake in 2015, which involved a large number of international actors, including search and rescue teams, international donors, humanitarian agencies as well as Nepalese response, the authorities, the military, the police, as well as the communities, the volunteers themselves as well. So a large number of different actors that all have information that are all making decisions. The second case we looked at is something more recent, which is the COVID-19 response and specifically the COVID-19 response in the Netherlands. And in this context, we again had a lot of different actors that needed to work together because the COVID-19 response was not only limited to a healthcare uh, aspect, uh, hospitals and healthcare providers, but also included aspects of our society, including the economy, public safety, enforcing lockdown measures, uh, logistics, uh, critical infrastructure, and so on. So in both these cases, we've used a combination of interviews personal observations uh, due to our presence there as information managers, as well as using uh, secondary data from public reports uh, and other information. So all these details are in the paper. So with this data and this uh, examination of these cases with that conceptual model, we arrive at our findings. And here we have actually found out that organizations do not go through this process, these steps once, but actually continuously expand their information awareness. So through our interviews and through the data analysis, we've actually found out it's almost a maturity model. Organizations grow their information awareness and they do so uh, in a couple of steps. The first step that organizations go through is really internally focused. It's about their own information needs, but also their own information availability, which people in my organization have information that I could use. Uh, use your own uh, team to start finding out what information they have and how do we bring it together. So this, the pictures you see here is an example of the COVID-19 uh, response team or one of the subsections in the National Corona Response Team in the Netherlands that is in the process of mapping out which information already exists within the team, uh, providing a framework so we're all on the same page. So the first step is making sure that yourself, you yourself are organized and you can bring the information together that you already have within your team. The next step, once that's established, is that you will start looking at your direct relationships. Other organizations you work for or with, you uh, close allies, uh, pre uh, organizations that operate in the same structures that maybe you have formal relationships with that are part of the same processes or systems. So the picture you see here is from what we call an OSOC, an operational on-site command, uh, sorry, an on-site operational command and coordination center, where international search and rescue teams operate. The initial coordination takes place. So these are people that already have pre-established structures, networks and relationships, and they put the information in, for example, in this way on an information board together. So people are using the own networks that, you know, speak the same language that were, that are within your comfort zone, uh, where you already have a strong commonality with. The next step is that you start actively building networks. So you might find the information needs that are still unaddressed at this point, and um, you need to start finding out information from other people. For example, the search and rescue teams can tell you how many people are affected, how many people are rescued, but the next step is that you need to find out how, what about the livelihood of people? Uh, what about their income? What about the food situation and so on? At this point, you start expanding your information needs, which also means you start expanding your network of actors that can provide information. So here you're using procedures and systems to connect actors. For example, in international humanitarian aid, we use something called the UN cluster system, where there's categories of organizations that make it easy to link in other organizations. Uh, this is used in Nepal, for example, to connect local authorities and agencies with their international counterparts. For example, in healthcare, in education, in food security, and so on. An example in the pictures you see here is again from the COVID-19 response in the Netherlands, where we started understanding needs for uh, post-mortal care. 
specifically funeral homes. And they had a lot of data about their capacities, if they saw any problems down the line and so on. So these are not people who are standard part of the emergency response structures in the Netherlands, but they, we could connect them and we could start getting the information that they had that we needed to start assessing how critical the situation was. So again, we're building out the network. However, the last step that we see a limited number of organizations making is one beyond the networks, is where you really start finding almost niche communities, groups, organizations that have very specific information that might not be available through formal structures and processes. These actors, uh, you cannot immediately find them. You have to take a lot of effort to find them, but the information payoff may be high, so it's also a risk. To give you an example, what you see here is a community, a district community in Nepal. And in this community, they already had a lot of information about their community, written down in paper sheets, in censuses they have done. And they not only have the information about their community, they also have the capacity to get more information following the earthquake. But that does mean that we need to start knowing that these actors have this information or could generate this information and connect with them. But humanitarian agencies are, for example, not standard looking at you know, what information exists in such a community, how can we bring it in? There's more effort needed because it's in a different language in a different format and so on. But the information could be highly valuable. This picture for me illustrates that pretty clearly. This is a teacher in Nepal that had his students map out, create maps of the community every year. So you could see through the maps how the community has grown, how many people live there and so on. This is very detailed, but valuable information for, for example, logistics, humanitarian needs assessment and so on. Moreover, he has the potential with his students to generate more information which means we need to start an, uh, a relationship with him. So this brings me also to the future research um, that we would like to present to you as a, as a final closing point. Because the first step in getting the information that we need in an emergency is indeed knowing who the other actors are, what information they have, or they could potentially generate and connect with them. But that's not enough. If we need to start connecting with other people, we also need to start looking at uh, our ability to exchange information with them. If it's in a different language, how can we, um, you know, what capacities do we need to bring that information into our systems or vice versa? How do we get our information to those communities who are in need of it in terms of semantics, in terms of syntactics, language, and so on? So it depends on your capacity to adapt, for example. Another consideration is, are we willing to share the information? That's not only in a political sense, but also a cost benefit analysis. As we said, in a crisis, time and resources are scarce. So we have to be mindful about how much time we spend on different activities, including connecting to other actors and sharing information. Now, technology has a great potential in reducing these barriers and enabling new flows. And this is something, certainly something we want to explore in our future research. With that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found this presentation interesting. For more details, please read our paper. And if you want to further the discussion on this, have interesting insights to share or want to collaborate, please kindly do get in touch with us. Uh, we would appreciate the connection. Thank you so much for listening to this presentation.